What is up everybody? My name is Lewis, also known as Mr. Camera Junkie, where I remind you to upgrade your skills and not your gear. Welcome to the live stream. Today is April 24th, just crossing over the midnight hour here on, on the East Coast. Uh, we're just passing over midnight to the 25th and I welcome you to the live stream. Welcome back. As always, I always start my live stream with a tip of the day. And today's tip is going to be based around today's subject, which is speed lighting. And my tip for today is to actually get a simple accessory if you do or are using a speed light. And that is to get a like off camera flash trigger. So I'm just going to bring this up here so that we can see what we're talking about. I got a very cheap brand on Amazon Andor. And this is what I'm talking about. This right here is the trigger and this is the receiver. As you can see right on top here, we have another uh, like hot shoe connection. And that's basically where this accessory actually comes into play. What it allows you to do is mount your speed light to it. And then the transmitter, let me see if I can get that in there. The bottom there has a little centerpiece so that when you trigger your camera it sends the signal directly to the flash to trigger the flash now this is limited to i believe one two hundredth of a second but most of the cameras are actually limited to that as well when it comes to sync speeds unless you're paying for something very high end which is what is called hss which is high speed sync which allows you to get synchronization speeds on your flash up to some even up to one eight thousandth of a second so with that being said that's that's this is a really good alternative to basically a budget uh speed light something like this like the speed light this one is a newer brand some people call it newer but uh the company itself i believe wants to be called newer so with that being said, I'm calling them newer. Um, the newer speed light, I believe this one goes for around $25 on Amazon. So nothing expensive, but with this kit, you can get some really good results. And I'm all about results. So when it comes to that, it allows you to take a simple stand that you would use for a light and attach that to the bottom throw the speed light there and allow you to take your flash modifier and move it off to the right or to the left or wherever you would like but it doesn't necessarily need to be directly on your camera now the good thing is that my flash modifier that i just mentioned to you this andor i actually decided to get one that was a little bit more expensive because it actually came with multiple transmitters so yeah as you can see these are two it actually comes with three in total and the three can actually be set to go off all at the same time if you're doing certain type of event photography and you don't want to carry around um like uh, a a speed light like this on top of your camera itself because these could get a little bit cumbersome this on top of your camera is a great alternative for the reason that you could actually set some of your speed lights up on different sides of the room and actually have them shooting into the ambient air if you're doing like an event so instead of having constant like uh flashes in people's faces you can actually set them up in key parts of the room so that while the ambiance is still low say something like my backdrop here with the colors and the ambiance still being low whenever you shoot your shot you're actually like just lighting up the entire room at the same time just for that split second so that you can get good lighting everywhere you go if you're doing an event so something this simple can really um can really have a lot of advantages if you use it correctly so that's my tip of the day and we are going to be talking about this and other accessories oh here's the other the third one so just to show you 
So I have three modifiers that get all triggered by the same, I mean, yeah, by the same trigger, they all get, they all flash. So I have three modifiers and I can set them up in key parts of the room so that you can keep everything dark. And as soon as you hit, you know, to take your shot, kind of the entire room just lights up all the ceiling so that you can get nice, even lighting wherever you go throughout the environment. So another key item that I like to use, um, which I purchased very inexpensively is this thing that's attached to the bottom. Let's see if I can get that. Yeah. So as you can see, it's attached. And what it is, is that the bottom part here will attach to your, to your pole. Then this just gives you the ability to angle. And the hole allows you to put an umbrella in to diffuse the light or actually still put it in a like soft box that I also have. So I put this entire, like, um, this entire set inside of the soft box with my speed light it allows me to have a nice diffuse soft box outdoors and still get, you know, one, two hundredth sync on my flash. So today's tip is, you know, when it comes to lighting, you can get a lot done with minimal equipment once you know what you're doing and let your imagination go wild because one of the most famous quotes that i've heard is um necessity is the mother of all invention so if you have a necessity you might just want to put a little thought into it to see if you can come up with an invention yourself that will help you you know get the job done so with that being said let me go and say what's up to everyone here in the chat first we have randall how are you doing, Randall? Welcome. Nano is here. Tech for your needs. Blank Boulevard is saying hello. Okay. Let's see if we could bring this down. Oh, these magic mice. I'm going to get a new mouse. I'm going to tell you the truth because magic mice, they're way too sensitive. Okay. Question. To start things off, when using the A6100, do you put the wheel selector to A or P or manual or even auto? That's a very good question, Randall. To be honest, a lot of the photography that I do for myself, you know, like just random photography when I'm in my vehicle running around town, just, you know, bringing down like the, the window in my car and just taking out the camera, just snapping a quick shot. 90% of the time right there, I'm probably going to be in, um, I already have some settings preset when it comes to my white balance and things like that. But 90% of the time I'm probably going to be in aperture priority. Uh, I just want it to have like be as much simple auto, but I do want to determine the depth of field of how much I want in focus, whether it's something that I just want to get, you know, like the, 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 the background, you know, in Boca or blurred out. Or if I want a lot of it in focus or just need to stop it down for the reason that it's way too bright, especially with the way lights change here in South Florida uh, throughout the day, I can make a left turn into a thunderstorm so it can go from sunny bright to like just pouring rain and vice versa. So that's the way that the weather and the light happens here in South Florida. It's constantly changing. So it's a it's a pretty good playground when it comes to learning photography because the light is constantly changing. So nine times out of 10, I'm probably going to be an aperture priority. Whenever I do a photo shoot, it's always manual. Make sure that everything's done correctly. And I use, you know, um, I use an expo disc to make sure that I'm constantly uh, acquiring the best um, white balance throughout the shoot as the light changes throughout the day. So great question. All right. Raphael is here saying hello and happy Saturday. Okay. That's super small. Let's bring that over here. Raphael. I'm glad that you're able to make it, sir. I know it's kind of late, but I'm glad that you're here. Okay, so Mario's here as well saying hello to me and to friends. Do they take batteries for the flash modifiers? Ah, that's a good question. They do. Um, the modifier itself or the trigger that I got, I keep testing it. I make sure that it's off, but whenever I do turn it on, just to see if I can show you, the light always clicks on. It has like one of these, 
long last batteries kind of that you would find on an old you know like car remote or maybe even like the newer car keychains basically has like one of those long life batteries in that the triggers themselves because they're the ones doing the majority of the work they work off of two triple a not double a sorry two triple a batteries and what i actually have myself when it comes to my speed lights and these triggers i have all um rechargeable batteries so i use rechargeable batteries on all of my stuff because when it comes to photography it goes way too fast just way too fast and you'd be spending a fortune if you're not using rechargeables when it comes to all of this tech so that's another tip make sure that if you're using you know um, speed lights to make sure that you're using rechargeable batteries because if not it's going to cost you an arm and a leg and whenever you're not using them make sure that you take those batteries out and put them off to the side if they need charging charge them up and then just also leave them off to the side ready for your next shoot you always want to be prepared like you know pre and in, 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 in not be on the back end when you're doing these things so i always try to be doubly sure whenever i'm doing my uh photo shoots so one second here okay so okay blank boulevard that's just came killer too big all right i found another a6100 on kijiji and was willing to buy it but there is a white mark on the lens now, if you mean a white mark on the lens, like on the glass itself or something like that, I can understand if it's physically on the outside, like, like a white mark on the lens, I could care less. So that's my opinion to you. If, if, you know, depending on where the white mark is, it depends on what deal you would get. Okay. So we have another question. Adobe RGB, RGB colors for the pics. I actually, I think I mentioned that in a previous uh, live stream. I do change all of my cameras to run Adobe um, RGB within the color um, science that it's using in my cameras because I use multiple cameras and I use Adobe products to color correct all of my images. So it's kind of like a no brainer. So they can all have their own styles, but when it comes to matching the skin tones the way that I like to for my portraits, it has made it a lot easier for me to, when I made that switch. You know, no matter whether I'm using Sony, my Nikons, the Fuji, anything that I get my hands on, I check that first. And if I can shoot in the Adobe picture profile or color profile, I select it and go from there, which I, I believe I have not found a digital camera like dslr or mirrorless that does not have that in there and i'm thinking going back from the canon 5d which is close to a 20 year old camera going like i think that came out in 2002 so anything that you find that's digital is most likely going to have that and that's actually what i use for my photography Sly is here. How are you doing, Sly? Says, hi, Louis. Hello, fellow junkies. Louis, I really like your border tonight. Thank you. I'm working on this little thing. You know what I worked on? This new support me for um, the Mr. Camera Junkie to buy me a coffee. Because the one that was there, right? The, the one that comes naturally with the program wasn't working. And every time I would come here to actually like move around the comment or make it bigger to fix it, it it was like taking control of the entire bottom half of my screen and it wasn't allowing me to do anything. So I went on canva.com and I made this little like, you know, upgraded little uh, buy me a coffee little patch thing. And I just threw it on there and I'm like, that, that works a lot better. And it allows me to work better with the comments. I says, Here's a link to that Kijiji. Well, I don't know if you'd be able to put links in my chat. Let me see here. 
Yeah, I don't think you'd be able to. Randall says, I like Adobe RGB because it's less yellow and have more natural colors. Uh, yeah, and what, you know, when it comes to portraits, which is another topic that I was going to do in the future, which is, you know, um, what I look for in portraits or how I shoot my portraits, you know, what I was taught and what I think looks good. A lot of it has a lot to do with, you know, like the same way you would shoot video. Now, video or, or film, that is, you're going to be looking at the main principles. You need to make sure that, you know, you're, you're framed correctly, that you're not off axis, so you don't look like you have a Dutch tilt, you know. Um, a lot of the same things. And, and the biggest thing when it comes to portraits is where you cut people off because you're not always going to do a head-to-toe portrait. You know, you're going to use your feet to zoom in and get a tighter shot, uh, fill the frame. And when you do that, you got to know exactly like where to cut people off in the photos. You never want to cut them off at joints. So you never want to cut people off in photos when at their elbows, at their waist, at their knees or their ankles, wherever there's a joint, you want to shoot for the middle in between areas, like halfway through the, you know, like through the shin. So you, in between the knee and the ankle is ideal because it gives like context to the picture and it makes it look natural where your mind could actually fill in the rest comparative to cutting someone off right at the knees and make them look like they were amputated. And it sounds crazy, but it does. It just does so much. So how you compose your images has a lot to do with the images themselves. All right, Charles is in the house. He says, hello, friends. Happy Saturday night. How are you doing, Charles? Welcome. All right, this is a little soft when it comes to the music. That's a better song. There we go. He says, yeah, but it's on the lens. Okay, then if it's on the lens, what I could tell you to do is, if it were me, if you're looking to get the body itself, try to get the body as cheap as possible. And maybe just even tell them like, hey, you know what? I'll give you this much for it because I won't be able to use the lens and I have to invest in a piece of glass as well. So I have to use some of the funds that I would use to buy it from you on another lens. Now, if you decide to buy the camera without the lens, I would still tell you to tell the individual, the person who's selling it to bring the lens so that you can test the camera. But if you get a good deal, then you can still buy it without the lens and then work on getting another lens. Like right now, you know, the kit lens is good, but you're always going to want to upgrade the glass that you're using. So right now, like I love, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to give you a little hint, like the camera before I went live, I had this lens on it. This is the 10 to 18 F4 OSS. Now this is a nice little compact lens. And when it comes to outdoors and like vlogging, self-recording, it's great. Uh, 10 millimeters gives you a 15 millimeter equivalent, which is super wide, but you do get, you know, that fisheye distortion. Uh, you lose the distortion around like 16 millimeters, which is a 24 millimeter equivalent. And that's where you lose it on this lens. It does, uh, you know, zoom out to 18, but I'm using it as a 16 millimeter and what it's like the big, how can I say this correctly? Um, I guess the biggest benefit to using this lens for me would be that it's OSS, that it's optically stabilized. So for vlogging outdoors in bright sunlight, you're going to stop down your lens already to try to prevent some of the light coming in. Uh, I can leave it at F4 because I use a variable ND to try to get you know, like a slower shutter speed. That's just 
the way that I shoot, but you can still stop it down and not have micro vibrations when you're hand holding the camera. But I had this lens here to actually do the live stream. And then I'm like, if I'm at a 16 millimeter to get the look that I like, I'm going to throw on my Sigma 1.4 and boom, right there. I, I just threw my Sigma back on there because I absolutely love this lens. I'm running it right now at 1.4. The ISO is at 100. So I know it's a super clean image. What more can you ask for out of a Sony a6100? Because that's what you're looking at right now. I think it was a couple weeks ago that I made the switch. So right now my second shot, let me see, my B cam right here. This is now my Sony a7R II using the my 24 to 70 f4. So this was my normal A camera, but now I have it as my shoulder cam because I've been liking the way that I'm using my Sony a6100 as my main camera so much. So one second, I'm going to hydrate. All right. Okay, he says, oh, that's too big. Because there's a fingerprint. There's a white mark at the bottom of the actual lens. You can get away with something, and this is just another thing to let you know. I'm just going to bring this up here, right, for reference. Let's pretend that this uh, filter here was the entirety of the lens that we're talking about, right? If that's the entirety of the lens and the like the damage or the scratch is down here towards the outside of the rim, I can guarantee you that that will not affect your image. Probably the only place where you would see that is if you go and pixel peep into the bokeh in certain images and that's it. And that's just from my experience. Like I've got, like I got a really good deal on a piece of glass. It was a Canon L series lens that had a scratch on it on the outside. And trust me, I tested the, <laughs> the out of that lens <laughs> and I could not like get uh, any like negative results from it because it had a scratch on the outside. Now, if it has a scratch directly, like dead center, right in this spot right here of the lens, obviously that's going to like degrade your quality of, of your image. If it's anywhere on the outside areas, mo I can almost guarantee you, you can get away with using that lens, but it's only if you can get a good deal on it, you know, because if it's damaged, you're not going to pay for it. Like it's new, right? you're already dealing with you. So if you can get a good price on the camera and have them just kind of like throw in the lens because it's damaged, go ahead and take it, you know, if, if it meets those parameters, but you know what, I'm probably going to make that one of the topics of the live stream. Um, because I do have a, a pretty good experience on buying used cameras and people have asked me like, what is it that I look for? And, um, you know how to check shutter counts and stuff like that. So probably make a little like how to what to look for, you know, besides just looking at overall physical damage, because sometimes we get excited about getting a good deal on a camera and we overlook all of like the defects because we're just looking to make sure that it works. And then when you actually get it back, you start seeing like, oh, it was like scratch here. It looks like it was dropped there and different things like that. So for example, my, my NEX six, I got it really cheap because I knew it was mistreated. And I was like, Hey, you know what? I'm only going to pay this much for it. And they were like, you know, what? I'm not using the camera. And I got it like that. I think my first Canon I got. Yeah. My first Canon was a, a similar situation. It was. The Canon T2i, 
and it was off the used market and this person had this camera beat up the back LCD lens not the LCD itself the lens was cracked the rubber that would go around the, the, the camera itself was completely missing and they had put like electrical tape over the handle <laughs> it was horrible it was in such bad condition that I went to see it I was like yo I'm not gonna buy this and it worked the camera worked with lens I bought it for $50 five zero and I was like, you know what? That's all I'll give you. And then the guy was upset saying like, hey, the camera's worth more than that. I go, yeah, but in much better condition. I'm like, the way this is, you know, with the work and everything, that's all I have to do. And I bought it for $50. Then I took it home and I put the TLC that it needed. You know, um, I went on eBay and found the replacement rubber grip that it needed. I think I bought that for like $13. I had to wait a while because it was coming from China. It was the only one that had it available. So once it got here, that's when I completed the repair. But in the same time, I had replaced the back LCD glass or the lens itself. So that looked new and had no scratches on it. So now we were able to see the LCD correctly. And I went into a little like um, detailing thing like I use. I've mentioned this in previous live streams as well that I use a paintbrush to actually do a lot of dusting for my electrical work. It gets in there, especially for like older keyboards, like mechanical keyboards that you want to get in between the keys. This works great, especially because it has the linear design in it already. Another thing that I use when it comes to this is a toothbrush. like. An old toothbrush that you're about to throw away because all the bristles are everywhere I would tell you to actually just cut down all the bristles that are going everywhere and actually make the bristles shorter because be when you make them shorter they get closer to the base and they get tougher once they're tougher and you kind of just like re-level them flat you can use that to do a hard brush when it comes to like all the little grooves with the dust that you can't get just like clean with something this soft and with those two little things i'm able to really clean up the dust and bring back like the luster of electronics and with that being said after that the camera worked fine for me for a long time and that's when i moved over from nikon to canon because I liked the way Canon was working for me at that moment. So that's a long story, right? <laughs> yes, it was. All right, let's go to the next one. Kevin Cox is in the house. What's up, man? He's saying hello to everyone. How you doing, Kevin? Thanks for stopping by. Okay, so Randall's saying like is the white mark on the glass or on the side or on the center of the camera well, if it's on the center you don't buy that camera that's that okay andre is in the house what's up man how you doing sir say i use the a6100 for all my videos yeah and right now i honestly now i'm i'm gonna oh man this this magic mouse Come on, Magic Mouse. Work with me, Brad. Okay. Um, the A6100 for video like this, the skin tones that I'm getting off of it is like mind blowing. Like, I'm just gonna switch to camera two here. Did I switch? No. Let's switch to camera two. Okay, and back to one. Can you tell the difference? I guess I can. I see like the more like yellows in this camera and the skin tones look a lot more natural with the A6100. Um, once I noticed that, that's when I kind of like switched and I was like, yeah, this is gonna be the main camera. And I wouldn't be surprised because I had thought of this already of just grabbing another A6100 with another 16 millimeter from Sigma because I absolutely love that combination. Like, absolutely. But right now, that's another topic for, for, you know, for discussion, so to speak, for the reason that 
you can't find the a6100 right now like everywhere is out of stock and there's almost like a rumor where that they might be discontinuing the a6100 which is amazing but i also know that if i'm if i'm correct Sony is still to release three more announcements of cameras this year. And if that's true, then there might be a replacement, which let's see how the rumors go crazy with that. All right. He says it's on the glass. says i can't wait to get the sigma 16 millimeter f 1.4 that's what you're looking at right now man i absolutely love it look at look at my gimbal and stuff in the background over there completely blurry just it makes it makes all the colors in the back just blend and just gradient so nicely he says i'm trying to get the sony 18 to 105 f4 that's a g lens that's a really good lens and if you get that lens the 18 is gonna give you more like yeah like a i believe it's like a 20 or a 32 millimeter equivalent 29 around there but you could go all the way to 105 which will give you something like of a 150 or 160 something millimeter equivalent so it's got a great range for a walk around lens especially for photography you can also do video with it because it's oss so that's what's really impressive with that lens you know all-in-one lenses they do a lot because I still shoot with my 24 to 70. You just want to have the versatility of sometimes just not moving your feet and just going and getting that little extra reach. Okay, Charles. Okay, this is trying to make it smaller, make it bigger. The Sony A6100 used with lens right now is under $300. There's one at Queen of Ponds here in Orlando with the kit lens for 275. Charles, I'm in South Florida. Send me that link. I don't believe it. I don't believe that an A6100 with kit lens is still anywhere for that price. Because the A6000 right now, because of like this shortage of cameras, which I, I didn't want to say it like that, but it almost seems like there's a shortage of cameras. Um, that the A6000s right now on the used market are, are being sold for like $500. Oh, you know what I can do? Oh, you know what? I did something else, right? I, you know, trying to make everything better. I have a new scene let's check it out boom are you familiar with this this is the iPad so now with the iPad I'm able to look up videos play them and I have the iPad connected like I normally would have had my like secondary computer so now this is fun okay I have offer up boom this is my favorite application when it comes to looking for used gear so right here let's just go and see oh, oh it's not giving me the the keyboard how am i supposed to type something in okay fail let's see if i bring it up sideways nope maybe the bluetooth keyboard is connected to it let's see Yeah, it looks like it. There we go, Sony camera. Boom, on the fly. This is nice. Okay, so right here in South Florida, this is what we're looking at when I put in Sony camera. Let's look at this one. 
Sony NEX5 DSLR camera. I love, you know, I could honestly tell you, I can crack up on the way people um, label these cameras. You can get a really good deal when you know somebody doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, I've seen it more than once where they take the alpha symbol from the camera. Let me see if I can get the camera here. I find this hilarious. You let me know. Okay. I'm showing you my Sony camera, right? You see the little A right there? That's a Sony Alpha A. People have seen that symbol and say it's a CX, like Charlie X-Ray. So I've, I've seen posts on OfferUp that say, I'm selling my Sony camera CX 6000. <laughs> I just crack up and I'm like, they have no idea what camera they have. Okay. So this is $150, but that's really old. You wouldn't be able to get pretty much anything out of that. Let's see here. Look. $400. This is what we're looking at on a Sony A6100 in white. So we can see the quality and they're asking $400 just for the body. So to see it a 6100 and, and to know the, what that camera can do and to say that it has the kit lens for $300, if it's true, and I'm not doubting you, send me that link. I have half a mind of driving up to Orlando and seeing if I can pick that up because I'm tr to get this there again and have two a 6100s that that'll just that will be so awesome. I don't like songs too much to have words in them. Then you can't hear me. All right. See Sony a 6000 with the 16 to 70. That's a full frame lens. A lot of people probably didn't like this lens. They said this is one of the worst lens that Sony and Zeiss have actually made together and it falls off really bad when you go telephoto. If you're shooting towards the 16 millimeter, the widest aspect, not so much, but that's also more towards the corners. And when you're dealing with APS-C, this is probably not bad because this is also an image stabilized lens. So 16 to 70, the, the Zeiss Vario Tessar, that might not be a bad deal. See, that's, that's what they're selling here. This is 600 Sony A6000, two batteries with the lens. This is cool. I think this is fun. All right, let's go back to the main shot. Okay, so Charles said that it was the Queen's Ponds. I gotta check that out. Okay, another question. What picture format do you shoot? 3-2 or 6-19 or 1-1? to I shoot 3-2 uh, three, three, to maximize my um, my megapixels because that's what most people don't understand. You know, the megapixels has to do with the photo sites on the actual sensor. When you go into 6-16 six, by 9, you're going to go and you're actually going to make it a lot wider and you're going to remove the megapixels from the top and bottom. So you're going to give it more of like that cinematic look and you go wide. Uh, a 24 megapixel camera like my a6000 will actually go down to 20 megapixels because that's all it can resolve in the strip that I'm allowing it to to receive. That's what happens when you go into like the super 35 mode and everything like that that's why the sony a7s3 there's so many cameras i just need to make sure i'm saying it correct the sony a7s3 with a 12 megapixel sensor once it starts shooting video it goes into the 16 by 9 and it becomes a 10 megapixel sensor and that's where you get the same exact specifications 
as the FX6. Because they're the same exact sensor on the FX3, on the FX6, and the Sony A7S3. Whew. Let me hydrate. All right. But yes, I, I shoot um, three over two. A six over 19. Okay, new APS-C upgrades for Sony A6700 or 6900 or the A74, unless they already did two, the update to the A7R3 and four LCD screens. That's a good question. I don't know if the LCD would be like the biggest thing because I've mentioned this also before, but here we go again. I feel that even though people can knock on Sony LCDs saying like, oh, it's not the brightest and the resolution is this and that. One thing that they are is that they are color accurate. And that's that wins like results win in my book when I and I've done this and I try. It's like, OK, I, I say I've done this not out of necessity. I've done this because I wanted to see if it could be done and how close I can get to it. So I was on a photo shoot with my cousin and while she was measuring the light levels, I measured the light levels with my eye, just using the temperature mod and trying to match what was on the back of my LCD to what I was seeing with my eyeball in real time. And I came up to a, to a measure and when I told her, she's like, this is the number that I got. And that's the same thing that I had on my camera. So I was like, yes, meaning to me, like that was just a way of measuring myself to see if as a photographer, if I did not have the expo disc and all the luxuries that we have to make our job easier, I, I, forcefully made it harder on myself to see if I can get by without having the need to that, you know, to actually say like, I can take a photograph that's at least up to my standard, no matter where I go with or without my own equipment. So that's where I always talk about the, the biggest thing that changed for me is when I understood white balance and start understanding light. Once you get to that, and you start heading down that rabbit hole. That's when a lot of things, that's when things change for the positive for me when it came to my photography. Just as um, I saw it two days ago, call them tomorrow. They are open. Yeah, I'm going to go back to the chat because you wrote it down, you know, like uh, Queen's Pawn on Colonial. And I'm just going to check it up and give them a call if it's still there. I'm, I'm going to see what I can do. I'm going to see if I can take the drive because that's an incredible, incredible deal. Like incredible deal. That's something that I'll be like, I'll be, I'm, I'll be surprised if they still have it. Okay. Oh, he put it there as well. Okay. Actually, you know what? Let me take that down. We don't want to be broadcasting that to everyone. Maybe somebody in Orlando gets to see that tomorrow before I get there. Start snatching up my deal. The Kevin Cox says a 6100 with kit under 300 is a steal. Yeah, even at $300 like it would be a steal just the body alone. So if you can get it with anything with kit lens, just yeah, I have two kit lenses that I actually still use. If I get a third, I'll probably be selling it, you know, just just so that I can put a little bit more towards the budget towards the next Sigma because absolutely like Kevin, you, you know, you know, in the LGL, everyone constantly talking about like, if you're going to get a lens, get the sick, especially, you know, for things like this, the talking head. And I, I just, it, it's such a great lens, 
such a great lens. This lens has actually prevented me from spending buku bucks on getting the 24 1.4 G Master and the Sony and having to budget for that because whenever I want images in that focal length or that fast or saying with that type of aperture, I have it in this lens and the 24 megapixels that I get off the a6100 do not disappoint. I'm very happy. So when I want that type of image and I get that itch in me, like, oh, that's why I'm constantly. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm knocking over the microphone. Um, that's why I'm constantly using this lens. I just absolutely love it. And that's why I also know that's why like the G Master 24 uh, 1.4 is such a, an incredible lens is such a sought after lens. Um, so crazy how I'm. I use the 24 millimeter so much now when I used to just only use 50 millimeters. Like it's, it's so crazy or like a 50 millimeter equivalent, you know? Okay. It says, remember once you, once in a while you get great deals from pawn shops, I bought a Manfrotto tripod with Manfrotto fluid head, which sells a B&H for over a thousand dollars for 80 bucks. I did remember you mentioned something like that. That is amazing. Like, like I was going back to it. I get good deals on the offer up application because you know, not everyone knows. And sometimes, Hey, you can, you can strike while the iron's hot. And another thing that I use with offer up, actually, let me go to it to see if I can show you guys right here. I get notifications. So right here, it tells me, Hey, two new Sony lenses have just been put out, which are these two. We already looked at this one. That was for $150. Okay. And then we have this one, which is the Sony, uh, the Sigma 30 millimeter F 1.4. They, <laughs> okay. Okay. This is the full frame one. I was going to say, I thought this was the APS-C. And I was like, why are they asking $700 for this lens? Even though this is a great lens, full frame, uh, 35 millimeter F 1.4, I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> uh, the new G masters from Sony are absolutely ridiculous. If you're going to spend the money in the full frame. And the reason why I wouldn't get it is not because of the, the price or the the results that you get off of that lens, it'll mostly be because of the size. That thing is big, like hella big. All right, let's go back over here. So yeah, with offer up, you get like updates and this thing's constantly ringing, trying to sell me lenses and things like that. But when you see a good deal, you need to like message things sometimes just really fast, just to make sure that you can get that deal. You know, like me trying to see what I can do about this crown pond tomorrow. There's only four a 6,100 cameras on eBay. Look at that. That's see, like these are the things that I notice and people don't talk about. And I really feel like right now, like we are kind of like on this camera shortage. I don't know if it's that Sony decided, you know what? Maybe there is a limited amount of, you know, like whether it be sensors or I mentioned before, like the rare earth elements that are used for a lot of the technology that's built into these cameras. Because if we were still talking about like film cameras that were like, completely mechanical like my Zenit up here that's older than me maybe and it still works because it's completely mechanical there probably wouldn't be a shortage of anything when it comes to cameras but when it comes to the digital aspects um, you know we're talking about uh, uh, um, computers basically with the ability to take images and the latest camera like the Sony a one has dual processors, you know, some of the Nikons and things like that also carry the same type of infrastructure where you're using two uh, processor chips. And I believe the new Canon, the new, new one that they're talking about with the quad pixel autofocus, which if they name it, that that's just, I find it a little funny because 
The first time I ever heard of quad pixel autofocus was from Casey and the camera conspiracies. Like he called that as a joke. He's like the best camera I want quad pixel autofocus. <laughs> and I, I remember laughing so hard. I was like this dude is off his rocker talking about quad pixel autofocus and for Canon to actually use that abbreviation, they, they could have called it anything else. They could have called it anything else, but nope, quad pixel autofocus. There you go. <laughs> like, I like if people are already using the name, why not? Right. They're just going to use the clout that continues. There's probably a hashtag already built around that. So <laughs> it goes to show you, I find it funny, but it's because they're actually producing their own dual stack sensor, which I believe if you have a sensor that has dual pixel and you stack another sensor on top of it that has dual pixel quad pixel autofocus and that's just me hypothetically guessing you know and that that's why i find it funny you know like quad pixel autofocus but that could just be me it says you can find great deals here and there they asked me if i wanted to buy it i said no i only shoot with fujifilm well let's see Let's see. Fingers crossed for me. Kevin says for streaming, the 16 millimeter is fire. It absolutely is. Absolutely is. It says I'm in California. Or oh, I'd be all over that. <laughs> right? Like, and the whole thing is that I use this camera so much. And when I look at it, I'm like, it was the other day that it hit me that I'm like, like, you know, here's another tip guys. Um, these cameras that we, that are so hard sought after, especially right now, don't ever leave anything like this. Just sitting in, in your car or just, just don't, just don't it. Especially if you're here creating content like you kevin you know that we're using this for our live streams and stuff like that this is so vital because this is part of the connection that we have to everyone out there you know like my connection to you guys here to my camera junkie crew and this it's it's just it's just so important right i just looked at the camera and i'm like oh man like I guess I'm reaching this level of like trying to go over redundant, you know, and be like, I need a backup for the backup, but let's, I digress. He says, don't sleep on Mercari too. You know what? I've tried Mercari and I just, you know, I, I'm, maybe I'll, I i got to look at it again. When these apps first come out, I do try them out, which is probably wrong because I tried Mercari like when it first came out. And then I was like, nah, this isn't working. Like, and because it's, it's unpolished, you know, it's not complete. There's still things that it needs to work on. I need to like revisit these applications and maybe Mercari is one of the ones that I need to revisit because I got that when it first came out and it was just not good. Like I would search for something and I would never find what I was looking for. Like it just, the search results were just completely everywhere. So I was like, there's no point in spending time on it. So I would have to check it again just to make sure. I know they discontinued the a6100 not too long ago. Is it officially discontinued? I, I have to check Sony now. Cause that's the whole thing. I thought, I thought it was just something that's kind of like, like that they didn't announce, you know, and they're just like, maybe nobody will notice, you know? So <laughs> I have to really check that out. Okay. It says the R three. Is that the new Canon? The R three? Maybe I, I messed up the name. Jared Polly calls that. Don't be it. <laughs> don't be it. Oh, Okay. It says take your gear with you everywhere. Yes. Like everywhere. Like, and that's, 
that's another thing because one of the things that I would do was just like leave my camera in the car just so that I have it with me everywhere I go. But now I won't leave it in the car and now like dealing with my son. So if I'm carrying my son and then I have to carry a camera and then I have to carry like his stuff and it's just adding another piece of something that I can leave somewhere. And then that also like kind of scares me. Like, I don't want to just leave my camera out of negligence somewhere and be like, oh, my God, I just left my Sigma 16 with my A6100 somewhere and just it's gone. It's not like an iPhone. There's no iCloud lock on it. They'll just grab it and start using it. And there you go. <sighs> OK, Mario's here. Says I'm confused about the 619 crops versus the three uh, three over two. You get less total pixels, but the pixels per uh, square centimeter stay the same. So you get the same quality just cropped in, isn't it? Yes, you do. But it just depends when it comes to. And this is going back to Randall's question of how I shoot photography, because that's the difference. When I shoot photography, I shoot in three over two not uh, or the three by two not and uh, not the 16 by nine for the reason that like this camera here for example this is a 42 megapixel camera a lot of times you know when it comes to photography you want to get the expression or the like the reaction the moment more than anything else so yeah of course in focus but you want to get the expression, the reaction, that microsecond, and that's what you're aiming for. So with that being said, I have a lot of pictures that I take here purposely wider than what I normally would, because I know that I'm going to post process them. So for example, I've taken some shots that are not centered correctly, but because I'm able to move that in post, I'm able to get the image where I want more. So having that leniency in the extra megapixels in that aspect, if I were to take my 42 megapixel camera, it wouldn't be a discrepancy of like two megapixels. If I were to shoot 16 by nine here for photography, I could go wide right but then what i actually be losing is kind of like i'll be making it like a 36 megapixel camera because i'll be losing a lot more megapixels due to the pixel density on that sensor itself so that's where the differences come into play but for me it just has to do with hey like did i get all of the person in did i get the toes into the shot maybe i won't even use it because i'll crop in later but i have that ability to do so and most of my like adjustments when it comes to post process, when it comes to photography is like leveling, you know, making sure that my horizons are straight so that it doesn't look like it's a Dutch angle. Yeah. And then just making sure that once I do that, I have enough room within the frame to crop that out the way that I like it. says you can find steel sometimes but you have to be there when they're listed yeah that's actually why i like the offer up because i get notifications like hey something was just listed you might want to look into it and i'm the one who's setting it up not just so i put like sony camera sony lenses um and then just like camera and camera lenses because you can find anything. So those are my search queries that I have listed with offer up so that I get notifications when anything of those keywords hit the, the market or hit the program. It says nobody has them new anymore when I'm guessing we're still talking about the a6100. Yeah. And you can't get them new. Like you can't get them from Amazon, I believe. What? Oh, this was huge. Okay, it says wear backpacks for gear and toys. Son carries an arm. If back goes out, then wheelchair. <laughs> In that case, better get a close, closer parking. Uh, 
That's that is true, but that's that's funny that you mentioned that, like all the aspects that you would get. But just don't. I will never leave the camera in the car, regardless. It's just you know, it's just like another thing, a little loophole, but. It does sometimes become easier when I'm dealing with Aiden and things like that to have him in my arms and stuff like that to just leave the camera at home. And it sucks because I hate doing that, but sometimes it just is easier so that I have peace of mind that I know that I didn't take it anywhere so I wouldn't be able to leave it anywhere. And now with this like setup here like this, it also, I guess I'm also being lazier because it's easier to just leave them set up and be like, oh, yeah, I'll just leave them for the live stream. But I have been using my Fuji camera for photography more, you know, for like just my little snapshots and stuff like that more like in the past couple of weeks because I've been taking that with me instead of breaking this down. Okay, is Kevin saying to Randall or get a wagon that keeps the gear on your back? Or I guess he means like off your back, like get a wagon. My cousin has one of those wagons, the ones that they actually like fold up and everything. So she'll just fold it out and get all her props. But she does a lot more of like children photography and like uh, newborns. So she has a lot of props, you know, when it comes to photography. Okay, the the three two has higher pixel density. I'm just trying to figure out if like is that how you say the three two? Because it's six nineteen, right? Or, or sixteen by nine? I mean six nineteen. Listen to me, I'm talking fractions. Sixteen by nine is how you would say it. So it would be like three by two. Okay, so let's go back to it. I'll say it like that. The three by two has higher pixel density than the 16 by nine. You can see them when you select it on your camera while the three by two is 20 megapixels versus 16 by nine is at 16 megapixels. Yeah. And the cameras will let you know, but basically what you're doing is that you're cutting it off. Like, so it's like, you just, it's, it's like the physical aspect. You can't expect it to have more megapixels when you're limiting the amount of sensor that it's actually being used. So when it comes to photography, I just try to maximize as much so that I can get as much in the picture so that I can decide what's going to be in or out of the photo in post. But that's what I do with photography. You know, it's not it's, um, the the sharpness and everything of the images are not going to change just the amount of megapixels that are actively being used. But then this is when I also come into the same aspect, right? If, if you can understand the concept that was just mentioned, right? About it physically being limited because you're cutting the amount of megapixels that you're using. That is in like in sense, the same thing why I'm constantly talking about that you don't kind of like lose bokeh or depth of field when you use a full frame lens on APS-C glass and you don't. So if it's an F 1.4 and you multiply, okay, let's say it's a full frame 16 millimeter F 1.4. That means that every part of the sensor that's getting hit with light, at that open aperture is getting hit with 1.4 amount of light, hypothetically, if I'm explaining this correctly. So if I decide to not use a full frame sensor and use a APS-C sensor, why would that be considered less light of 1.4? The depth of field and, and the amount of light and the image quality that hits the sensor is exactly the same. But the reason why people are saying it, that it's less light is not because the image itself would look like it's darker. No, it's because there's less physical sensor being able to capture the amount of light. So it's like 
a pizza that you could only eat half of because you only have half a pizza to eat. It was made a full pizza and you would have that physically, but because you don't, you're only limited to half a pizza. And that's kind of like the way that I, I don't know if that works for you guys when it comes to explaining. So, you know, you're not losing light through the aperture by putting a full frame lens on your sensor. If it's APS-C, you're just losing it because the APS-C sensor does not have the capability of consuming all of the light that the, that the lens is giving. So hopefully that explains. I'm going to move on. Camera in southern heat could damage it too. You know, that's just to tell you one thing. I have left my camera in the in the car and I've never dealt with anything as far as heating problems. And I made a video not too long ago about um, actually that's one of the videos that I have here um, about my shorts. The, the YouTube short video. Let me not say that I made a video about my shorts. <laughs> That's not what happened. <laughs> Let's speak correctly, right? Okay, I made a YouTube shorts video about um, extending your buttons, your hard to reach buttons. So let's see if we can focus here. See the hard to reach buttons on the camera. I actually add just a little dab of hot glue onto it to make the buttons easier to click. So I made a video about that and somebody says like, does it melt and get sticky or tacky? And I'm like, actually, no, I use a high temperature glue. And even though I've left this type of setup like this in my car with the South Florida heat, not even the heat of the car has even like make any damage on the, my glue buttons. So that's that's one thing that I can say. I've never had that issue with my vehicle. So lucky me. It says Best Buy ZV1 open box way under 600 and throw it in your pocket. I'm scared of me throwing cameras in my pocket. I had a camera. Well, I can show you this camera. <laughs> Let's go into story time. All right. This little Sony pocket camera. What is this? This is the HS. I forgot the DSC HX80. It's a this has got a little flip up finder viewfinder. Let's see if we can see that. Yeah, right. It's got a little flip up viewfinder. The battery is completely dead. It has a flip up LCD. It's got a Zeiss, um, you know, like it's got a, it's, it's a little decent little pocket camera that it's kind of like an RX 100. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to throw this in my pocket. I'm going to throw this camera in my pocket and start using this little thing. I think it can get a lot of images that I want done until I threw it in my pocket. And when I turned it on to use it, my pocket forced onto the LCD and pressed onto it, breaking the LCD. So not the actual lens itself, but the LCD itself, the liquid crystal display. And when I turned on my camera, it was like just it was completely black. All over here just black I couldn't see anything at all and the price of the camera itself is pretty much the price of the LCD to replace it um, so after that I just stopped using it and now it's just a decoration piece that's sitting right over here because it's kind of like a total loss it, it'll cost less to just replace it than it would to fix it and it's a lot faster because replacing it, you know, all I have to do is pay for it and have it shipped instead of like having to try to fix it, opening up that camera and spending all the like time and the man hours of replacing a used camera. So my personal experience, I don't do too well with, uh, you know, 
cameras in my pocket. They go bad. So I stay away from that. I will not buy like a new ZV-1 and then throw it in my pocket. I will have to baby that so much, which is probably why I stay away from those cameras. Or use a point and shoot camera which stays in your shirt pocket. You see, he said that's a good idea. I don't have a shirt pocket. Like, and I'm thinking now, do I use a shirt pocket? Not most of the time I'm, I'm in a polo shirt like such. It says the ZB one is a point and shoot. And he says, exactly. He goes, but then there's mobile phone with a good camera. That's actually what I was leaning more towards. You know, I wasn't saying it like that, but I'm still on the iPhone 10. And from what I'm hearing, the new one has a really good camera for photography that might be able to not suffice like my a6100 or anything like that, but a point and shoot something of that sort, or maybe like a ZV one that you can get very similar results with your camera. So. If that's true, that's something that will probably benefit me a little bit more than than getting another point and shoot. Oh, Joanna Swan is in the house. How are you? Welcome. And Kevin says, ouch. I guess he's talking about, yeah, my LCD. Yeah, I, and I was really upset. I was so excited with the camera. And I'm like, oh, let me take it out. And when I go like this, it's like I did something just like putting in my pocket and hopping into my car driving. And then when I got out of the car, LCD has gone. Uh, you know, the ZV one is probably a little bit better because it has a fully articulating screen. Meaning if I were to put it in my pocket, I would think ahead of time and make sure that the LCD is facing the inside of the camera so that you get the plastic part on the outside which probably would prevent it from damage in my pocket. I'm just a little iffy about it because stuff like that has happened to me before. That's it. You know, this camera right here, this little point and shoot here, I'm going to bring it back up. When it folds down like this, it only folds down. It has no fold up feature where I could actually like rotate the, the LCD. So when it's back, it's open faced and available to take damage with the ZV one. You can flip that upside down so that you can have a like hard plastic shell on the outside, which will probably prevent a lot of the damage. All right. The iPhone 12 pro max and the ZV one are very close in their manual controls on the iPhone. Yeah. And I also have, um, you know, programs that I've purchased through the iPhone, like, um, I have a couple of different camera apps. Uh, I, I am going to get Filmora, I believe, because that gives the clean image. I was thinking of adding another like top down camera that I had before. So, you know, like for product showcasing, but I was thinking to just use an iPhone camera to do that, you know, and just add the Filmora. But I work on iPhones, so I can find a, like um, what's called a blacklisted iPhone. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this term it basically means that maybe somebody didn't pay off the phone completely or it was reported lost or stolen. When that happens, the phone no longer works as a phone and it's just basically like a glorified iPad or an iPod where you can still connect to apps via Wi-Fi, but it will never work as a active working phone to receive cellular signal anymore. But all the other features of it just working like a webcam and things like that work perfectly fine. So for that reason, I'll probably be able to just grab something that I have lying around here and use it in that manner. What's up? Raymond is in the house. Hi, Louis. Popular Sony APS-C cameras, the A6100, A64, A6600. Unpopular Sony APS-C cameras, the A6365 and others. A6000, A5100. The A6000 and the A5100 are still being sold today. That camera, like, I, I don't know if you were here earlier. It was just on an app over here, and they're still being sold for 400 I just got a hot tip 
I'm not gonna say more than that, but a hot tip on an A6100 in the Orlando area for a 300 with kit lens. That sounds too good to be true, so I'm gonna be checking that out tomorrow. And uh, and yeah, but thanks for stopping by, Raymond. Nice to have you here. Okay, so it says my RX100V put in my pocket, and the LCD got a black spot. Went away after two years. You see, like mine did not get a black spot. Mine got a cracked LCD with lines and everything. It looked like like broken glass. You know, like if a baseball went through a window and you see the spot where it took the impact and the shatter, it just went everywhere and just green, purple, and blue lines. Oh, so bad. The good thing was that at least for when that happened, I was able to use the viewfinder to take some images, make sure that they were okay. But the viewfinder on that particular camera is so bad. It is so bad. It is like looking through a keyhole. And the thing is that if you were to just move your eye a little bit like this, you lose the like vision of, of what you're trying to look at and it just goes to black. So it's just there's only one specific like dead center spot that would actually give you like the viewfinder to work on that because of the magnification and how small everything is in that camera. Just yeah. Filmic Pro, that's the one that I was actually talking about. Filmic Pro is good for manual controls as well. Yes, that's the one that I'm thinking about getting for the video side, the Filmic Pro. I have uh, quite a few, but they're more photography based apps, not video. I actually was looking at one of those um, applications that I have and what it does is that it actually allows you to use your iPhone camera as a macro camera. And there's an image that I got off of that of like a jumping spider that usually just it just leaves me in shock. You know what? Let me see if I can find it, because now that I have the iPad connected, I can literally just throw it on there. Yeah, that sounds cool. Let's see if I can do this real quick. Testing on the fly. OK, so what uh, what am I doing right now? I'm going into my photography apps. Okay, so it was called camera plus two. I'm looking at my images, okay? And I've selected the image that I'm talking about and now I'm going to share it. And now I'm airdropping it. It's not finding my iPad. That's not good. Come on. Okay, you know what? Which one did it go to? Okay, I went to this one. Okay, that's a little weird, but we're getting past it. Okay, so I have the image over here. Let me see if I can send it from here now. Let's see what we're looking at here. Boom. Okay, I think I might need to update my phone. Something I didn't recognize my iPad here. How's the quality? Okay, well, let's check it out. This is the image. If you're scared of spiders, okay, I just want you to know this is a, a, a this is a macro feature. Macro is like so. This this spider was like that big. Okay, let's check this out. Let's move this over. That didn't take long at all. Okay, so this picture here is a jumping spider. It's on my car. So the texture that you're seeing of the paint itself, that's to let you know how close I was able to get to this. But this was shot on my iPhone 10. I think this is like an impressive shot. So check that out. That's pretty interesting to me. Like 
I was impressed with the capability of this. It is JPEG. I couldn't get raw because that's actually why I have it. But that's a pretty decent shot to say that that was taken on my iPhone and it's a macro. So let me know what you guys think. Okay, I'm going to go back to the main shot. Okay, so Raymond says, yeah, the A6000 is promoted by many YouTubers as the great budget camera for 2021 if the shooter doesn't need 4K video. Absolutely. That's That was the only reason why I really pulled the trigger on this guy here. On my A7R2 because I was using the A6000. I wanted to get better portraits but when it came to videos it had all the upgrades that I kind of would have wanted out of the a6100 but it actually acts more like the a6500 because it has all of the picture profiles so the a7r2 gives me s log s log 2 and that hybrid log gamma that's very popular I'm honestly telling you, I've dabbled a little bit with them. Don't really mess too much with the with the log um, files because I it's a photography camera for me first. So, but it had all of those features. So when I was going to spend my money, right? And I was like, you know what? Should I get an A6100 to upgrade my A6000 or should I upgrade like my full frame camera, which was at that time the a7 mark one I, I go upgrade that camera to the a7 r2 i'm gonna get all of the megapixels the you know the eye autofocus and all of the upgrades that i would want out of the a6100 but then i'm also gonna get ibis in body camera stabilization so if i'm using it with like the sigma a61 i mean the sigma 16 millimeter that i have on the 6100 right now I, I would automatically make this lens image stabilized. It shoots 4K and it has all of those picture profiles that the A6500 has that not even the A6300 has. So it was like all of the benefits. I was like, you know what? Instead of getting the A6100, if I would hypothetically buy the A6500, which was still more at that time when I grabbed this one, I believe, or right around the same. So to me, everything led that I was like, I can get all the added features that I don't get out of my A6000 out of this camera. Plus, it's going to also level up my full frame A7 Mark I. So I did the whole finagle and I purchased this one i pulled the trigger on that camera it's been awesome for me and then i just so happened to get lucky and i've mentioned this before i was lucky that in may of last year this one hit the market and i picked this up for 500 dollars with the kit lens so when i grabbed that and i had it so now i had the a6100 4k i had the a7r2 4k i was like i i don't have a need for my a6000 anymore and i sold it and i moved it on and it, it went into happy hands for somebody else um kind of wish i still had it now but it was just sitting like on my shelf like this guy <laughs> it was sitting on my shelf like this guy so the A60, the A6000 is too good of a camera and it wasn't broken. So I sold it, moved it along and I know it's taken hundreds, if not thousands of images since then. So it's in a better place. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Kevin says. Does your camera have HDMI or USB out that you could use for an overhead and use a monitor is hooked up as your viewfinder? Which camera are you talking about specifically? Does the camera have HDMI or USB that could be used for an overhead 
or use with the monitor that's hooked up as your viewfinder on the a6000 if that's the one that you're talking about if that's what we're talking about here yes from the question what i'm understanding you're saying can the a6000 be used with like a monitor externally through hdmi that you can face towards yourself to use as a front facing uh monitor absolutely that's why the a6000 was so popular because that's what a lot of people did i even rigged something there i have it in one of my videos where i made just like a simple mirror that i attached to the hot shoe so it was just a little contraption that would go and go off to the side and angle a mirror and that mirror would allow me to actually here i can show you with this camera can i oh this one here so the a6000 does not have a flip up screen it is like this one that has a flip down screen you know a, a tilty articulating screen and what i would do was i would leave it just like that fully open and then off the hot shoe here, I had a little contraption that would take out and cover a, a, a mirror in this general area there, allowing me to see what was on the LCD just by being the fact that it's a mirror. And that's how I kind of did my first selfies on the A6000. <laughs> It's funny because I made something like that. I believe there's an actual company now that has a device like that where it's like an articulating mirror that you could add to like all of the cameras that don't have front facing um, capabilities. So there you go. But can it be connected to an HDMI to get video out? Absolutely. You can put it just straight to a monitor or or like one of those Atomos ninjas because those will allow you to record in even higher uh, bit rates. It says I message it to yourself. I think you were talking about the, the photo. I got the photo on there. Yeah, he says that's a phone photo. Nice. Yeah, it is. I used what was the app? It's called Camera Plus. I think it's the second version. So it's Camera Plus 2. Um, it gives you the ability to shoot raw out of your camera and it's just basically it uses your camera as like a connected device and then has its own program to run its own like algorithms with the hardware that you have in your phone I've and it keeps its own little um, storage for its photos so I just opened up that application and was able to find the picture of this spider guy He says it's a very cool shot. Thanks, Kevin. It goes the one with the broken LCD. Oh, I don't think so, but I'm going to check. See, that's a good thing. I, no, I don't even think it has an HDMI out. No, I really doubt it. All it has is this standard micro uh, micro USB there and when I close it it says multi oh, it's upside down Let me see that. it says multi meaning it does multiple things and most likely well it definitely doesn't have HDMI so it won't have a clean HDMI out and being that it's such old technology, I can honestly tell you it's not going to have anything when it comes to software that I could actually connect it and get a, a nice image. Because even if I connected via the HD, I mean via the micro USB, I connected my A6100 via the Sony utility like web app. Not good. I was, I was going to say hot garbage. And I guess I just did, right? Hot garbage. <laughs> like, that's like the image is no good coming off of the USB. It's, um, there's not enough bandwidth to get a high quality signal and power up the camera and communicate and do all the things that it needs to do. It's better than a standard webcam. Yes. Not good enough for anything like this. Not for live or streaming or anything like that.
Oh, he beat me to it. See, I didn't even get to it. It says, I believe that camera has no HDMI out. No, it does not. It says, might be able to use, you see the webcam utility? I, I already answered that question ahead of time. <laughs> but I like the way you were thinking because that's exactly how I think. I always try to see like what's the most. But the thing is that, you know, I have a, a Sony, not a Sony, listen to me, an iPhone XR which that has a pretty decent um, camera on it as well that I think that I can just attach temporarily to get an overhead. I was using this second cam for it, but this is too nice of a camera to just have hanging out for about 10 seconds of a live stream, right? It's just, this, this is a good shot. Oh, something's yelling at me. All right. Well, what time is it? It's 1.30. I'm at the end of the chat. Well, I was... did. Let me just ask you guys right now. Do you think that I... Because I don't think we even really got into the photography or the lighting that much. But it is what it is, right? I hope you guys uh, had fun. I'm going to be closing things out. I'm just going to give you this last chance to see if you had any questions about anything, whether it's the A6100, whether it's about speed lights, how you would use them. Because one of the things that I was mentioning was for event photography, right? I take this adapter here, put this on a stand. I have the connection for the transmitter. Now then I would connect speed light on top boom and now this is what we're looking at and what I would do is taking this I would place this somewhere where it would be like away if there is a dance floor those are usually like great locations because uh, you can set them up on the corners of the dance floors like maybe on opposite corners and you could face the light towards the ceiling and away from people so it doesn't flash them directly it should give you good ambiance and it allows you to take telephoto type images in events because the synchronization is happening through the trigger so you can sit on the outskirts knowing that even though it might look dark through your viewfinder at the moment when you snap the picture the flash is going to be engaged. The dance floor is going to be illuminated correctly the way you like it, allowing you to capture the images that you want. So maximizing what you have, which is basically saying upgrading your skills. And part of the skills is comprehending how your equipment works and how you can maximize it. Because we do spend a lot of money on gear and gear is important but what's more important is to actually make sure that you're maximizing and getting the most out of your gear um i i have to tell you the truth i i suffer from this myself not so much when it comes to photography but i am learning more into the audio realm now um from just that's the newest rabbit hole that i've been falling down into um, a little bit of information about me, which is I submitted my first audio audition for voiceover work, which could be another business venture, which it seems it's it's very exciting to me. It's it's all brand new and I'm using it as well as part of my new rabbit hole of falling down the, the audio rabbit hole when it comes to learning the technology and comprehending how it actually works because some people could just know gear and tech and know names and all this stuff like when I'm telling you that I'm learning audio it's like I'm learning the nerdy stuff I'm learning frequency ranges and how the harmonics of you know frequency patterns work and that's kind of my language when it comes to the tech and the nerdy stuff that I love so um, right now, I've really been hitting the audio education side through YouTube and everything like that. Uh, YouTube University, man, it's amazing. So I've been able to learn so much as of late when it comes to audio that has just been blowing my mind. So that's a little bit of what I've been doing on top of, you know, photography and, and YouTube itself. So with that being said, let me check 
Oh, everybody's just saying good night. Okay, Kevin's saying I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for the chatting. I appreciate all of you guys coming out here and just hanging out, man. I, I can't tell you how much this means to me. It's so much fun to come every Saturday and know that no matter what happens at, like during the week, I'm going to have a nice hangout and talk about like my favorite things. Uh, I'm, I'm really hitting this hard. I, I, I want to do all of these things is why I mentioned them like I, I got to get on the ball and start my podcast. Um, but that's also part of this audio venture because audio is just a whole new venture just like um halfway involved with video uh because at least with video i think i was able to adapt a little bit faster because of my experience with photography but when it comes to audio um i'm really what did they say drawing at straws because it's all really new especially how technical i'm you know i can get audio to work i have my mixer my levels i have my sound effects and i got the things working the way that i like them right but still a whole nother level when it comes to voiceover work and cleaning up and learning how to edit audio that is like editing audio and i don't know if uh, that's a question for you guys if i don't know if anyone knows if there's a audio editing program that works similar to like final cut you know maybe like with the magnet i don't know if logic is works or yeah if logic is what i'm looking for that works similar to final cut because it's off of the same you know apple ecosystem so to speak or the platform um, native to apple but if you guys know anything, just leave it in the chat. I'll be looking it up. Um, yeah, because I'm now learning how to edit audio the same way I'm learning how to edit video. So it's it's so much fun. I can't say nothing. I have so much fun. And as always, I thank all of you guys for hanging out here with me. Um, I appreciate all of you taking the time. And uh, I will see everyone next week, as always. I'm going to try to see if I can do it earlier. Today was not a possibility, but as always, you can count on me that it might not be the earliest live stream, but it's going to be the most consistent live stream because I am definitely going to be here Saturday nights and you can count on that. So thank you everyone here, all of my camera junkie crew, CJC, appreciate all of you guys. And with that, I will just say good night, stay safe. And I will see everyone next week. Till next time.